What is up, everybody? Thanks so much for tuning in. Today, we're going to be addressing the second part in my two-part series, What is the Place of Jewish Tradition in Messianic Judaism? Yes, yes, yes. My name is Messianic Rabbi Eduardo, and today we're going to be talking about the Messianic movement and the reality that we do adopt many things that come from the Jewish tradition and the rabbinic spectrum. But does it need to be total? Does everything that the rabbis say need to be authoritative to the Messianic movement? And what I want to address in this video that I didn't address last time is that the rabbinic system is an enclosed system that if you decide to take everything total, everything holy that the rabbis say, then you will find yourself rejecting Yeshua and being in opposition to the new covenant faith. When the reality is that, as I said in the last video, Yeshua is the one who truly sits in the seat of Moshe, Kisit Moshe, and he's the one that gives authority to his disciples and his Talmudim to make halakhic rulings and judgments for their communities. So today what we're going to do is we're going to address the rabbinic system, and we're going to talk about the reality that the rabbinic system, traditional rabbinic Judaism, doesn't allow you to just pick up the whole thing and then tear it apart. Rabbinic Judaism wants to give you systems, customs, traditions, and rulings that are total. And we're going to start with a word from a scholar, Dr. Kaufman. And he says that the traditional belief in the divine origin of the Torah includes not only every word, but also the accepted interpretation of each letter. For both the written and the oral law are ascribed as the revelation to Moses on Mount Sinai. To be transmitted thence from generation to generation, Whoever denies the divine origin of either the written or the oral law is declared to be an unbeliever who has no share in the world to come according to the Tanetic Code and consequently according to Maimonides also. So essentially the oral law, the traditions, the rulings, the, the, the understanding of the rabbis is something that a person must adopt that saying what the rabbis say come from the mouth of the God of Israel. And if you reject that, then let's go back to what Dr. Kaufman said in his book on Jewish theology. He says that if you reject this, the written or Torah, you are an unbeliever who has no share in the world to come. That's a huge thing to, a huge claim to make, but it is the reality of what is rabbinic Judaism. So Rambam, Maimonides, in his introduction to the Mishnah Torah, he says, All of the commandments which were given to Moses on Sinai were given together with their oral explanation. For it is said, And I will give thee the tables of stone, and the Torah and the commandment. The Torah is holy writ, and the commandment is oral explanation. Moreover, he commanded us to observe the Torah by the word of the commandment. Thus it is this commandment which is called the oral Torah. And what Maimonides does is he doesn't allow it to just be enclosed to what is written, but he says the scope of both Talmudic works comprises an exposition defining the text of the Mishnah. These are commentaries upon its complexities and a survey of the legal precedents established by the seceding tribunals during the intervening period between our Holy Master and the compilation of the Talmud. And out of both Talmudic works, the Tosefta, the Sifra, the Sifra, and additions, from it all is derived what is forbidden and what is permitted, what is polluted and what is clean, what is guilt and what is innocence, what is disqualified and what is fit. All is as it was transmitted orally from man to man, from the mouth of Moses, our master, even from Sinai. So what we have is a system by which a person who approaches it cannot think outside of that system that the rabbis had given their words, the, the divine status as what is given to the written Torah. So therefore, if we in the Messianic movement put ourselves under the authority of the traditional rabbis, then we can find ourselves in opposition to Yeshua, the Messiah. Let's go to tractate Sanhedrin 99a. It says that it is taught in another Bereta because he has despised the word of the Lord. This is a reference to one who says the Torah did not originate from heaven. And even if one says the entire Torah originated from heaven, except for this verse, any one verse, claiming that the Holy One, blessed be He, did not say it, but him, Moses himself said on his own. This is included in the category of because he has despised the word of the Lord. And even if one says the entire Torah originated from heaven, except for, pay attention to this, 
this inference inferred by the sages, which are the rabbis, Chazal, or except for this, a fortiori inference, or except for this verbal analogy, this is included in the category of because he has despised the word of the Lord. So what we're looking at is that in the Talmud, it is telling us that if you reject an inference by the sages, then you have despised the very words of God. So if we don't wear our kippot or our yarmulkes the way that the rabbis tell us to, the rabbis are telling us that we have rejected the word of the Lord. It's, a, it's, it's an insane thing to think that the rabbinic literature wants to have such a reach to have control over the people. So now we've established that the rabbinic system, rabbinic literature, the rabbinic customs are all encompassing. That they don't allow you to think on your own. Let's see what they say about Yeshua the Messiah. Because indeed, there are many passages that speak about Yeshua in the Talmud. But I want to go to the places that are not debated whether they speak about Yeshua the Messiah. In Berachot 17b, it says, In our open places, that we should not have a child or student who overcooks his food in public, who sins in public and causes others to sin, as in the well-known case of Jesus the Nazarene, Yeshua had not three. And this comes from the William Davidson Talmud on Sepharia. So anybody can look this up. The reality is that Yeshua the Messiah, who is the hope of the Messianic community, who is the hope of Israel, who is the hope of the whole entire world, is being called a sinner in the Talmud, which claims itself to be the very words of God. So it is not only in this place in Berachot 17b that we find references to Yeshua being a sinner, but there, there are other passages in the Talmud that speak about Yeshua as a sinner. We're going to go to Sota 47a. It says, For the Master said, Jesus the Nazarene, Yeshua had no three, performed sorcery, he incited the masses and subverted the masses and caused the Jewish people to sin. So where do the traditions of the rabbis, when we give them the authority to tell, stop? Do we just allow them to dictate what we do in our communities based upon how we live, what prayers we say, how we say them, when we stand up, who who responds when they respond? Or, or are we allowing the rabbinic system to speak for itself because it wants to claim absolute control of the interpretation of the text? So even here, it says that Yeshua Hanotri, this is Jesus the Nazarene, Yeshua, he was a sorcerer and he cited the masses and subverted the masses and caused the Jewish people to sin. See, brothers and sisters, there is a reason why Yeshua gave the authority, the halachic authority, to bind and loosen on earth and in heaven to his Talmudim and to his disciples because the reality is that the progression of what God is doing goes down to Yeshua the Messiah and to his disciples because ultimately there will be things like this that are said, things that are rejecting him. He's called a sinner, a sorcerer, a subverter of the masses. This is completely against what the Brich Hadashah teaches us about Yeshua the Messiah. And the reality is that you need to decide for yourself which is going to be authoritative for you. We understand, yes, it's the Torah. Yes, it's the Tanakh. But through which lens do we view the Tanakh? We must view the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, what is typically called the Old Testament, through the lens of the Brich Hadashah, the New Covenant. Or you can go the rabbinic route and view it through the lens of the Mishnah. But the reality is that the Brich Hadashah shows us a different understanding of who Yeshua is. That not, Yeshua was not a sorcerer. He did not lead the people astray. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. See, we need to understand that there is only one way to truly view the Hebrew Bible, and it is through the lens of what God has done in bringing the Messiah, that the Messiah is the goal at which he was pointing towards, that it is the things that he was looking towards. So the reality is we have three approaches that we can approach rabbinic tradition, Jewish customs, Jewish minhagim, with uh, one is a wholesale rejection. And this is not something that I advocate for. We cannot just push aside all of Jewish tradition and all of rabbinic tradition and all of rabbinic literature. We can't, we can't just push it aside because there's much in the tradition that is beautiful and meaningful and it speaks to our lives and it is honoring to the God of Israel and that is part of the heritage and the history of the Jewish people and that we as Jews can participate in. Now, there's another one that I can't, I can't absolutely go for, which is absolute adoption, which I just spoke about. 
The rabbinic system presupposes that you would absolutely adopt its principles, that the words of the rabbis, the words of the sages are equal to the words of Moses because they were given by God on Mount Sinai to the Jewish people. We can't accept this because there are words in the rabbinic traditions and rabbinic customs that are contrary to the New Testament, the Brich Hadashah, and that they are contrary to the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. And, and many times they're contrary to what the Tanakh says as well. The method that I recommend and suggest is called skeptical inter integration, that we would approach it with the leading and the power of the Holy Spirit to pick up what God would have us pick up and that God, we would put down what God would have us put down and that we would do this with the power of the Spirit of God. So in closing, there is a, there is a standard by which we can approach all things. And that standard why we approach all things is the written word of God. In the book of Joshua 1.8, it says that this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. That it is the written word of God that we should be dictating our lives by. And the fact that we find such atrocious things about the Messiah of Israel means that we can't fully, absolutely adopt everything that the rabbi said. <clears throat> but we don't shoot off everything that the rabbi said. We don't push it absolutely aside. We walk in those things as well. From Exodus 34, 27, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words, what the Lord was speaking to him. For in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with all of Israel. That the covenant by which God is going to hold us to, the ultimate determining factor of sin and what's not sin, of righteousness and unrighteousness, of lawful and unlawful, is found in the written words of God. And why would it not be found in the written words of the Brich Hadasha? <clears throat> we need to, at this point, establish the supremacy of the Messiah, as I said in the first video, that the Messiah truly is the Baal HaTorah. He is the master of the Torah. He is the master of how we need to understand his word and his truth and his revelation. Indeed, he is the God of Israel, and there's no sidestepping on that. It is the truth. It is the reality. From Galatians 3.24, We'll look at this one more time. The law, the Torah, has become our tutor to lead us to Messiah. So it may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. That the reality is that there is a way of approaching the text and the scripture which comes out of the mouth of Yeshua the Messiah. And we don't need to be lost. We can find his reality and that it is the doctrine, it is the teaching of the Messiah, which needs to be supreme and, and rule total in our lives. It says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Messiah Yeshua is coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the anti-Messiah. Watch yourself so that you not lose what you have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, the teaching of Messiah, does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives them a greeting participates in his evil deeds. How much more so does this apply to portions of rabbinic literature and rabbinic traditions that reject Yeshua and the Messiah? Based upon this reality that we need to be focused on the Torah of the Messiah, the Torah of Messiah repudiates aspects of rabbinic literature that reject him. There's no way to say that there are aspects of rabbinic literature that go back to Mount Sinai that reject Yeshua the Messiah, that come from the mouth of God and reject the Messiah that was sent. It's absurd, it's illogical, it makes absolutely no sense. We need to be confident in who God has called us to be and made us to be, and confident in our identity in the Messianic Jewish movement, as Messianic Jews and non-Jews worshiping the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua. And we have to feel empowered by the Spirit, which God gave us as a deposit to salvation, that we can walk in holiness and completeness before him, that he has given us everything that we need for godliness and that we can have the authority to make halakhic rulings and judgments for our own communities. Luke 7, Matthew 18, Matthew 16, that we indeed were given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And that means picking up and putting down things that might not have seemed appropriate in other contexts. It doesn't matter that the church might not have picked up some of the Jewish traditions. Does it matter how they walked in it? Absolutely not. What it matters is that we follow the leading of the Spirit, we follow the leading of the Ruach HaKodesh, and we do what God is leading us to do because we have the authority and right. And indeed, it's not just 
it's not just the Messianic movement that sees this or understands this. There's a tradition within Judaism. In Midrash Kohela, it says, The law, they say, which a man learns in this world is vanity in comparison of the law of the Messiah or Christ, the Torah Mashiach. And this is and this is the goal that I want everybody to understand as I finish up, as I wrap up, is that there is a teaching that comes down from the Messiah, which reigns supreme. And any of the teachings that predate it or around it or that seem to be contrary to it, they are below it. They are beneath it. Of supremacy reigns our Messiah, his truth, his ways, his reality, his Torah, which is absolutely love for one another. And what it looks like colloquially, what it looks like in communities might look different. But if we are following the spirit, we'll be pleasing to our God. If we are following the Messiah, we'll be pleasing to our God. All right. So with that, I'm going to close up. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like it, subscribe it, share it, hit that bell. Until next time, man, blessings in the name of Yeshua the Messiah.